This is a microphone check. If you guys can hear me, someone say so. Thanks very much. Hey everybody, welcome to the big show number nine in our Goldendale Observation Series. Tonight we'll be talking about another natural occurrence, but one a little bit more common than the one we talked about last week, three actually, we'll be talking about equinoxes, solstices, and seasons in some form of order. Doesn't really matter which one we talk about first. Uh, however, that being said, we're being a little upstaged. I interrupt this regularly scheduled program for a much more rare natural event, the one that we talked about last week, the Great Conjunction. Uh, it is completely cloudy and raining right now. However, on Thursday, I was able to get some footage of the Great Conjunction with the moon, which was kind of pretty. So let's start with that before we get into everything else. So there it is. This is about an hour of time lapse, and you can very clearly see the moon there, of course, and then to the right, Jupiter and Saturn. Yeah. So, by the way, if, you can't, if you're not sure, that's the moon. As you can see, they're moving into the clouds there. I'm just going to let this loop a bit. It was an even better conjunction of the moon and the two planets on the day before, on the 16th, but it was really bad weather. So I was happy to get this, in, at least. The, uh, the moon was right next to them the day before. This is also a good lesson in the motion of the moon. Notice how in a single day it moves significantly to the east. So it's no longer quite next to them anymore. And I had to use a wider lens as a result. So yeah, the, uh, the conjunction is definitely on people's minds. We're getting a lot of calls and questions about it. And uh, if you didn't get to see it yet, there it is. Uh, even, in a few, even over a few days' time, the distance between Saturn and Jupiter will have decreased even more. And of course, tomorrow... The 21st, they will be at their closest conjunction. Again, I'm not too optimistic about the weather tomorrow either, but I will do my best. I'm going to try to do a special show at 5 p.m. tomorrow, same channel. Uh, if we fail, I'll, I'll indicate as much. I'll put some kind of a static graphic up on the screen saying the weather won't allow it. But tomorrow, we are going to attempt to broadcast the Great Conjunction live, uh, weather permitting, starting at 5 p.m. 
Okay, so back to the topic. Solstices, equinoxes, and seasons. Those three things are kind of linked and connected to each other. And I'm going to ask you, let's get this going with some interaction. Goldendale Observatory is a public facility. We exist for sake of education. We want you to learn something tonight, so please ask questions. Uh, on that subject, answer this one. Why did we choose tonight to talk about those three things, solstices, equinoxes, and seasons? What do you think? I'm going to watch the chat. Someone tell me why we picked those tonight for, that, for those three topics. What do you think? Watching the chat. Almost there. Yeah, okay. Well, almost to where? Someone says almost there, but which of those three things is happening tomorrow? It, it, by the way, this has nothing to do with the Great Conjunction. Yeah, that's right. The winter solstice. Very good. So the winter solstice is one of those things we've all heard of. A lot of us don't know what it means or what it entails. By the end of this program, hopefully you'll understand all solstices, well, both solstices, the winter and the summer solstice. We'll also talk about the equinoxes and, uh, like I said, seasons. Now, all these things have to do with the motion of bodies in the universe, have to do with the tilt of bodies in the universe, how crooked they are or not. So these things are all connected and linked. Uh, during the presentation, if you do have questions uh, about other things, including the Great Conjunction, feel free to ask them or uh, make comments. We'll get to them, possibly. I am going to try to keep this show shorter, just because it's not that long of a topic. It doesn't require too much exploration to get the, the gist of it. So, uh, yeah, feel free to ask questions that are slightly off topic. I'll be happy to try to address them. Speaking of that, our chat's being moderated, and we'll hopefully be able to pick out the, uh, the gems of the night, the best possible questions, and maybe the best comments if there are any good ones, or maybe at least the most hilarious comments. All right, so where to begin? Talking about uh, solstices, equinoxes, and seasons, I think I'm going to start this show with a quiz. First, I'm going to show you a video. So, this is pretty cool. This is a footage shot from a geosynchronous satellite. The satellite, being geosynchronous, is parked, so to speak, over a very specific spot on the Earth's surface. In the Clark Belt, the geosynchronous belt, over 20,000 miles above Earth's equator. At that altitude, it takes 24 hours to orbit the Earth. And so the satellite appears stationary over a given point. And as this footage plays out, we can see the angle of illumination on Earth changing. Now, when you watch something like this, when you watch something from the perspective of a geosynchronous satellite, you might get the impression that the sun is going up and down. That's what it looks like. It looks like the source of illumination, the sun, is traveling up and down. But, of course, that's not what's really happening. The Earth is tilted, isn't it? It's crooked, 23 degrees. The satellite doesn't perceive that crookedness because the satellite agrees with Earth's motion because the satellite agrees with Earth's equatorial plane. That term's going to come up a bit in this presentation. So Earth appears perfectly straight up and down to the satellite, which, by the way, is intentional. This is a this is a Earth observing satellite, and it, it's intended to observe an entire hemisphere of our planet. Now it's neat how it reveals the shifting of illumination, and throughout the course of this video, you're seeing an entire year play out, aren't you? And we are seeing equinoxes. We are also seeing solstices. So like I said, I'm going to quiz you. So watch this. I'm going to put up a picture here. All right, this image depicts two equinoxes, because that's how many there are, and two solstices, because that's how many there are. So there's four images of Earth all at different times. So I want you guys to tell me which side, left or right, depicts equinoxes. I'm watching the chat. Left or right on the screen, which is depicting equinoxes? Okay, people are saying right. Oh, someone said left. Well, some of you are correct and some of you are not. I like it when that happens. 
Let me ask you a separate question. Which of the sides depicts solstices? Let's see. I'm watching. I'm seeing your confidence changing. Left or right? Solstices. Top left. Okay, that's interesting. Someone was specific and said top left winter solstice. Well, I have good news. Most of you got it right. The left-hand side are solstices, and the right-hand side are equinoxes. Hmm. I have to tell you that the equinoxes are kind of a giveaway. They're kind of a gimme because it looks like Earth is being evenly illuminated. And some of you might know that an equinox entails a equal period of day and night. Uh, that is kind of true. We're going to get to that in this presentation. It's mostly true. It's not exactly true. The solstices, on the other hand, are obviously different. We clearly see that northern versus summer, summer, southern hemispheres are being illuminated preferentially. Now, if someone was specific, and indeed, he was correct. The upper left is the winter solstice. The lower left is the summer solstice. As far as the equinoxes, it would have been difficult for you to determine that because there isn't as much information available. Notice the dates. The day, the actual day of the month can vary a bit, but it's going to be around that vicinity of time. We decide that the season starts on the various days. So winter solstice entails the first day of winter, summer, first day of summer. And then vernal is spring, and autumnal is autumn, of course, for the equinoxes. And this is one of those things we take for granted. We hear about this all the time. We hear these terms all the time, but we don't always understand what they mean. I have to admit, when I was a young person, I, I did struggle with this. I did have trouble understanding what was going on. Now I understand it pretty well. What I realized is it's actually pretty simple if it's explained properly. Let me go back to the video here. So, where to start? Solstices or equinoxes? Hmm. Before we get into this in great detail, I'm going, it's autumnal, not autumnal. Thank you for that correction, that's funny. All right, so uh, to help you understand why all these things happen, I'm gonna show you a very confusing graphic, and then I'm gonna show you some much less confusing graphics. I've discovered that's actually kind of helpful. If you try to wrap your brain around a complex graphic, if you really grind your gears trying to figure it out, you'll suddenly have this light bulb moment when you see a much better graphic. So. This sphere here essentially surrounds the Earth, and the Earth would be at the center of this sphere. And we see three planes. These are all imaginary planes established by humans for sake of charting, for mapping, and also for sake of convenience, allowing us to determine the position of things, not just our own planet, but other bodies that we observe from this planet. And when I say that, from this planet, that's very important because Many charting systems, many coordinate systems are based on an earthly perspective. Sometimes that seems a little strange. It seems a little bit, I don't know, arrogant or naive. But we do it because it just makes the observation so much easier. Because, of course, most of our observations are conducted from this planet. So, let's start with the celestial equator. Although this is a proper term, I've never liked it much because it, it implies some sort of cosmological construct. Like this is a space thing. But in reality... The celestial equator is simply a projection of Earth's equator into the sky. So if you were laying on your back at Earth's equator, looking straight up, you would see this plane essentially as a line. Notice the famous North Celestial Pole and the perhaps less famous South Celestial Pole. The reason I say that might be less famous is because the North Celestial Pole points roughly towards a famous object. What am I talking about? What famous object does this roughly point towards? Let's see if you know. What famous object is that North Celestial Pole roughly pointing towards? Anybody? I think you know. I think you're overthinking it. I think you definitely know this. Anybody? Really? I can't believe I'm going to have to give you this. North Star, thank you. Thank you very much. Very good. Oh, who said Magnetic North? That's wrong. Magnetic north has no bearing whatsoever on true north. Magnetic north changes quickly. Earth's magnetic field is crooked. It wanders about. It migrates. It changes position. It changes inclination over years. You may have heard that the shifting of Earth's pole has accelerated in recent years. 
So yeah, we never talk about magnetic north in the context of astronomy. What we're interested here in here is true north and true south because this has to do with Earth's actual axis of rotation, Earth's spins. Now, someone mentioned that Earth wobbles. It's true that over 20,000 years, 26,000 years, I believe, this north celestial pole will migrate around and, and carve a huge circle in the sky. That's why we don't always have a north star. Sometimes we have a different north star. We currently have no south star. So yeah, Earth does wobble, although in the context of this presentation, we're not going to talk about Earth's axis wobbling. Because in a single human lifespan, you wouldn't notice that very much. We're going to be talking about the fact that Earth's angle, its tilt, is fairly, quote, constant at around 23 degrees. And that has a lot to do with what we're going to be talking about tonight. Now, when I say that Earth is tilted at 23 degrees, you have to decide what your baseline is going to be. That can't be based on just nothing. That, has to be, that can't be arbitrary. And it's based on the red, the ecliptic, which is also slightly crooked here when compared to the equator of the sun, which we're not talking about. Right now we're talking about the Earth. The ecliptic plane essentially is a projection of Earth's orbit into the sky. Notice there is a disagreement between the angle of our orbit and the angle of our tilt. Hmm. It's very important within the context of this presentation. Are all planets like that? No. Some planets have more tilt, some planets have less. And this, by the way, does affect a lot of things, including seasons. We'll get to that. Now, on this image, we also have something that's not really pertinent to our conversation, but I wanted to point it out. We also see the galactic equator. Essentially, this is the, the equatorial projection of the Milky Way galaxy that we orbit within. And once again, notice, crooked within crooked within crooked, our solar system, our entire solar system, is crooked in relation to the plane of the Milky Way. And every other star system is too. If you were to look at different stars throughout the galaxy, you'd find that they were all tilted in different ways. There is no up in space. Any questions about that? Oh, someone mentioned uh, Thuban. I think it's Thuban, not Theban. Uh, the star, yeah, the, there was a North Star thousands of years ago. That's right. That's, that's no longer the North Star, but it will be again one day. That's right. Before I move on to something a little more illuminating, a little bit more clear, do you have any questions about this particular uh, graphic? Crooked within crooked. Remember that story about there was a crooked man in a crooked house? This was, of course, baffling to our ancient ancestors who would observe the motions in the sky and were, were so flummoxed because they, they saw motions that didn't make as much sense as they expected. They dogmatically insisted that everything had to be orderly, that everything had to be flat and circular, that motions had to be constant. But, of course, that's not what observation revealed. Observation revealed motions that seemed to change in velocity, that seemed to be different from ours in terms of inclination. And as astronomy evolved, we found this to be more and more true. We discovered that essentially nothing was lined up. Even things that we thought that were very much so were not actually aligned. So yeah, these angles made for complex observation, and you couldn't just, for example, write down the location of a thing and expect to come back the next year and find it at that exact spot again because of all these factors at play. Yeah. So let's talk about something a little simpler. A little better graphic now. I'm glad someone likes it, but it could be better. So, now we have a more clearly labeled graphic that illustrates just the Earth blown up as a cartoon form so you can understand what we're talking about. We've removed the galactic plane. We still see the north and south celestial poles. We still see the celestial equator, which again is not truly a celestial construct. It is again a projection of our equator. And again, we see the ecliptic plane, which again is a projection of Earth's orbit. Now, Earth goes around the sun. I have noticed a lot of times, including even sadly in educational videos, Earth's obliquity, its tilt, seeming to migrate like this as the Earth goes around the sun. That actually does not occur. So rather, the if the Earth's on this side of the sun, or this side, the tilt remains the same. The tilt does not precess in a single year like that. That would be baffling, and <laughs> it would definitely affect our planet if that were true. That has a lot of bearing on what we're talking about right now. So let's start with uh, seasons. I'm going to do a little. I'm going to do a little quiz again here. Let's go. Let's put this in the center of the screen, and I am going to 
illustrate the position of the sun with this glowing light there. So we see the sun is over here on the left. Now it's on the right. In both cases, notice the tilt does not change. Sun's over here, sun's over here. Of course, the sun's not going around us. We're going around the sun. So let's see if you guys understand a little bit of the basics about uh, seasons so far. What season is this? When Now, and by the way, I have to split hairs, and I have to say in the northern hemisphere. What northern hemisphere season are we seeing right now on the screen? I'm going to wait for you to answer. I'm watching the chat. Someone said winter, winter. Someone said summer. So the answer is winter. This is, the no this is northern winter. The reason I know that is because the sunlight is clearly striking the southern hemisphere directly while it's striking the northern hemisphere indirectly. This is the primary determining factor in seasons, at least on this planet. That's an interesting uh, hair to split. Not all planets have seasons for the same reason. Put my face back on there. So... In the case of this graphic, not only are we seeing the sun illuminating the southern hemisphere and creating southern summer, we're also seeing a solstice. So which solstice do you think it is? Again, based on northern hemisphere perspective, which solstice is this? I think I'm seeing it already. Winter, very good. So the sun is at its lowest point from our perspective during the winter solstice. Okay, then by process of elimination, <laughs> what do you think this is? Which solstice is this? This is the, of course, I'm going to say it. I'm going to synchronize it with the chat. Someone say it. There, this is the summer solstice. The sun has achieved its highest position from our perspective. And, of course, this is northern summer, isn't it? So... Northern winter, northern summer, because of the angle of illumination. And the reason we're also using solstices is because that's when the difference is most extreme. During the summer solstice, the sun is high, as high as it's going to get. And during winter solstice, it's as low as it's going to get. Again, from our perspective, because seasons are hemispheric, the opposite would be true if we were in the southern hemisphere, wouldn't it? Any questions about that? Now, the sun appears above two famous imaginary lines during the solstices. The tropics. Most of you have probably heard of the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. These are essentially the, the you, could, you could call them uh, longitude lines on Earth, where if you were to stand there or lay there, the sun would appear directly overhead during the solstices. So during the Tropic of Cancer, again in the Northern Hemisphere, that would be the summer solstice. When the sun is appearing over the Tropic of Capricorn, that would be, from our perspective, the winter solstice. Any questions about that? We're going to simulate this in a little bit. I'm going to show you some examples of what's going on here. In fact, let's do that right now. So watch this. This is the sky over Goldendale. Let's take away the delightful artwork. Let's pause time. We're going to go back to now. Okay, this is right now. I'm turning on an important line in the sky. This vertical line is the meridian. The meridian divides the sky into east and west, if you will, or you could even say more poetically, rising and setting. But either way, if something's transiting the meridian, it's crossing the halfway point in the sky. As you can see, Mars is about to do that. Mars is about to transit the meridian. So let's go back in time a few hours. Watch this. Okay, there's the sun. This was, uh, what was that? Noon, of course. This is solar noon, not to be confused with actual noon because of the magic of time zones and the inconvenience of human arbitrary concepts of time. Uh, the actual noon time rarely coincides with solar noon, unless you live in a particular place where it happens to by coincidence. Lucky you. I would not recommend setting your clock by solar noon, because it will almost certainly be incorrect. Now, before I continue on this discussion about the motion of the sun, I want to show you something else. Watch this. 
You might notice that the Sun is in a constellation other than Capricorn. In fact, it is in Sagittarius, the archer. They named those two tropics, the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn, after where the Sun appeared, the part of the sky the Sun appeared within when this phenomenon was noticed in ancient times. But because of the precessions of various motions in our sky, because of the fact that star charts are a little more accurate now, because we have redefined the boundaries of constellations, the sun no longer appears in Cancer or Capricorn at, during their respective solstices. Just something to, just, I thought that was interesting. So, for example, instead of Capricorn, we see Sagittarius. And then in, in the case of the Tropic of Cancer, the sun will actually appear in Taurus. So there's some, there's some trivia for you. Now, like I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you something. I'm gonna, because it's tomorrow, the solstice is close enough for what I'm trying to demonstrate here. I'm gonna speed up time in one day increments. So watch what happens. Here is the sun, up, 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 up. Oh, and now it's coming back down. Okay, so that was a year. We're back to the winter solstice. Some of you probably know where the summer solstice appeared. Way up here, see that? Yeah, so that's in June. And again, we go back down. And this is, again, December. The reason I'm able to demonstrate the sun moving in that figure eight pattern is because I'm moving in day increments and not hourly increments. If I moved in hours like this, the sun would wander all over the place like that. We don't want to show that. So let's get the sun back into the meridian. Now that figure eight pattern has a name. Let's see. Oh, someone wrote it. Good job. So Jim White here wrote Analemma. My uh, predecessor, Steve Sout, was a big fan of, uh, of sundials and also Analemmas. He uh, actually constructed a device that allowed him to chart out this figure eight pattern. Here's a picture of the analemma. This was taken by an amateur astronomer named Dennis DeSicco, and he, uh, I've actually used his stuff before. He, he does a lot of really handy scientific material, and this was done in the 90s. He must have been very busy in the 90s. A lot of his material was established then. But what he did here is he painstakingly photographed the position of the sun throughout the course of the year. And then the streaks indicate where he did a long exposure to indicate the positions of, for example, on the upper left there we have solstice in the lower right, another solstice, and then in the middle there an equinox. So this figure eight pattern, the analemma, does change in shape depending on where you live. Your perspective matters very much when it comes to how this figure eight pattern manifests itself. So that analemma, the reason it's not a nice loop-de-loop, -loop, the reason it's not a circle, is because everything's crooked. A crooked earth in a crooked universe. So we just saw the analemma drawn out in the course of a year. Do we have any questions about that so far? Go back to my graphic here. Speed up time again. Now I'm going to show you something else. Watch this. Let's go back. Let's actually... If there was a crooked Earth, who, was, who had a crooked orbit? There was a, that's funny. <laughs> so um, I'm going to turn on the Alt-Azimuth grid. This is the grid system that's based on your perspective. So straight up, 90 degrees. Let's look at the sun and its angle. So let's go, let's actually go to the solstice. And you'll find that the sun is only about 20 degrees above the horizon, incredibly low. This is quite inconvenient if you're trying to observe the sun, for example, in a telescope because there's a lot more air in the way. Now watch this, we're gonna to go to the summer solstice. And we find that the sun has now climbed to a very impressively high 67 degrees. That's quite an increase in altitude. But it's not straight up, is it? We often think of it as being straight up. If you're ever out working in the hot summer day, you know, in the sun, baking away, it feels like the sun is right over your head. But where we live, at this latitude, 45, 46 degrees, no, the sun is not directly overhead. However, like we talked about earlier, if you lived on the Tropic of Cancer, indeed, the sun would be 
right overhead. Very oppressive. Not a time, not a good time to be working outdoors in the summertime. Questions about that? Now I mentioned how this is inconvenient. Let me show you something. This yellow line is the ecliptic plane that we talked about earlier. Now I'm going to speed up time and I want you to watch what it does. Because we live on a tilted planet, the ecliptic plane seems to wander up and down throughout the course of a day. When I say the course of a day, I have the atmosphere turned off. See that? If the atmosphere were on, then we wouldn't be able to see anything. So I have the atmosphere turned off. Now, the reason I say it's inconvenient is because other objects appear on the ecliptic as well, of course. Essentially, all the major bodies in our solar system appear either on or near the ecliptic plane. So astronomers don't like it very much when the ecliptic plane appears low. So right there, for example... In the summertime, even though the ecliptic plane is high in the daytime, the opposite is true of at night. It's inconvenient when you want to observe planets in summer, because if they're out in the summer, they're going to appear low in the sky, which means, again, you're looking through lots of air. However, the opposite is true in winter. Let's go back there. Let's get back to our sun on the meridian. Close enough. Let's go back to the winter solstice. Close enough. Actually, yeah, that's good. There you go. Winter solstice. Now, the ecliptic plane is low in the daytime, but it is very high at night. And we like that because wintertime, if the clouds allow it, is a terrific time to observe planets because they will appear very high in the sky. Now, some of you might recall a cold, clear winter night where the moon is out, and the moon feels like it's almost straight up overhead, just like the sun would in the summertime. That's because of what we're talking about. Again, because of our crooked planet, the ecliptic plane shifts in position in the, in the course of a single day as Earth rotates. So the ecliptic will appear low at night in the summer, high at night in the winter. So this wintertime can be a wonderful time to observe uh, high-detail objects like planets, again, if the clouds allow it. Any questions about that? Any way the way it's been? Now, we have more to say, but I want to point out something about seasons in a minute. But first, I'm going to wait. Let's see if we have a question or two first about this. I'm looking. What is the North Galactic Pole? I missed that question earlier, but the North Galactic Pole is essentially above the, the disk, so to speak, of the Milky Way galaxy. Oh, I heard, a, I, don't, I think that might be a myth. The vernal equinox, you can balance an egg on its small end. I, I think that if you're able to do that, you're able to do it anyway. And I think that involves a, a high quality egg and maybe a hard boiled egg and some very patient skill in positioning it. Yeah, I'm not sure that it has anything to do with the equinox. In fact, in fact I'm pretty sure it doesn't. But that's fun. Okay, now, we talked a little bit about the solstice. We should now talk about the equinox. Someone try to define it for me, because this is an interesting topic. Let's, see, let's hear a definition of the equinox, because it sounds, it sounds easy to define, but it's a little more complex than that. So what do you guys think? What is the equinox? I'm just going to tell you. People think it's this, and I'm using the word think very deliberately. People think that the equinox is the, essentially a central point separating the two solstices. Now, this is kind of a fun graphic in that we have an oval that illustrates luminosity or daylight. We have a yellow ring that indicates the length of day, and then the, the black ring indicates length of night. People assume that the equinox is, as its Latin name suggests, equal night. It should be, but again, everything's crooked, and we do have some little details that we have to work out. There are some technicalities that we have to deal with. So you need to learn a new term, equilux. Equilux is, sep is different from equinox. Equinox implies equal night, but the equilux implies equal light. So we're talking about equal light versus equal night. And what's interesting is the equinoxes disagree with the equiluxes by a few days because of a funny little technicality in the way we d define sunrise and sunset. So check it out. The spring equilux 
arrives early, and the autumnal equinox arrives late, about three days late, if you're interested, roughly. Uh, let's see, this year, for, I looked it up, on March 17th, so three days before the equinox, we had uh, the equilux. So this happens every year, this disparity between equilux and equinox. And the reason it occurs, there's actually two reasons, but the, the primary reason it occurs is because we define sunrise as the moment even a tiny sliver of the top of the sun breaks the horizon. And we define sunset as the moment the entire sun is completely obscured. So because it takes some time for the disk of the sun to rise above the horizon, it creates a discrepancy of a few minutes. How technical? Because of this technicality, the equinox is not actually the equilux. So I'm going to try to demonstrate this for you. Let's, uh, let's, let's go over here to the east, where the sun tends to rise. I'm going to turn the ground on. I'm going to go into the future a few hours. Oh, I have to go way over here. Look at that. Keep going. All right, it's starting to be sunrise now. I'm going to zoom in a bit here. I'm going to turn off the ground. The green line is the horizon. Increasing time, speed again. Here comes the sun. Let's zoom in here. Let's get real close. All right, there's the sun. Now watch. The exact moment that the edge touches the horizon, here it is, watch. Okay, it is now sunrise. However, let's go into the future a few hours. Oops, I went too far, it doesn't really matter. Let's go over to the west. There's south. Southwest. Okay, west. Now, let's go into the future. Let's turn on the atmosphere just for funsies. Okay, it's broad daylight. Let's keep going. Notice that, e Notice that ecliptic plane, how it gets so crooked there because of Earth's tilt. Moving over here. Getting closer to sunset. Here comes Venus. All right, here comes the sun. Now I'm going to zoom in here. I'm going to turn off the atmosphere. There's a reason I'm doing that. All right, let's simulate sunset. Again, the green line is the horizon. Let's go a little faster. All right, here comes the sun. Now, if we were being consistent with our definitions, then the moment that the sun touches the horizon just now, it should be sunset, but it's not. Sunset is this, when the sun disappears completely below the horizon. And now I have some fake ground to block it there. However, here's the second reason this occurs. Here's the second reason for the discrepancy between equinox and equilux. Watch. When I turn on the atmosphere, now we're simulating the lensing effect of air itself, bending sunlight around the horizon such that we essentially see a false sun. The sun has indeed set. As you can see, it is actually below the horizon, yet it appears above it because the atmosphere has bent its light over the horizon. Isn't that interesting? Notice also the sun is being distorted in shape. It's being squashed. This is something some of you may have observed before if you've ever looked at a sunset through hopefully safely filtered uh, you know, optics like binoculars or a telescope. Yeah, so with the atmosphere at play, the sun's position becomes falsified. This is the second reason that there is a difference between equinox and equilux. Isn't that interesting? Any questions about that? Someone mentioned that the sun's disk is half a degree. That's right, and it takes a certain amount of time for that half a degree to, tr to transit across the sky because Earth only rotates so fast, right? So the uh, equinox and the equilux, different things because of the way we define day and night, the way we define sunset versus sunrise. And of course, it's not just the way we define it. If the sun is partially above the horizon, of course, the sky is still going to be quite bright, isn't it? So, just to remind you, the equilux is early in spring and late in autumn. Questions about that?
Why doesn't that happen at sunrise? Oh, it does. Let's see. So uh, I didn't, maybe I should have showed you that. Let me prove it. Hold on. I'll turn on the atmosphere again. Let's go over here to the east. However, it does not happen uniformly. It does not happen consistently because the temperature of the air also affects the lensing effect. Imagine that. So as you can see, we also get a false sun here. Now if I turn the atmosphere off, see, again, same thing. But because it squashes the sun, because it alters the geometry of the sun, it's actually very difficult to pin down with millisecond accuracy the duration of equilux. Well, we get close enough. Isn't that funny? Things that you thought were so set in stone are actually kind of gray because of that good old atmosphere bending light. And of course, our good old arbitrary rules about what constitutes sunrise versus sunset. Yeah. Fun topic. Questions about that? Is lensing effect lessened by mountains in line of sight? No, but your altitude is. So if you're on a mountain, for example, there's less air, and yes, it will change that. But that's, by the way, that's a whole other thing. If you want to, if you really want to split hairs on this topic, you have to also take into consideration your altitude. Eventually, you get so high that it doesn't matter anymore. The more air there is, the more this matters. Not that it, not that it matters anyway. I'm not sure that equilux actually impacts anybody's life, unless you're someone like, for example, a photographer or an amateur astronomer who actually does have an opinion about light and, and how useful it is to be purely dark or not. Something to think about. So that's a good question. All right, I don't have much more to say about equinoxes and equiluxes, but are there any questions so far about that? Any thoughts? Okay, we talked a bit about solstices, we talked about equinoxes. We briefly talked about seasons. And I'd like to go over a misconception about seasons. It's very common for people to associate distance from the sun with seasons. So, in winter, northern winter, are we closer to the sun or farther from it? I'm watching the chat. In northern winter, are we closer to the sun or farther from it? What do you think? I'm watching the chat. Are we closer? Ah, someone says closer. Closer. But that sounds crazy. Why would it be cold if the sun is close? Because, again, it's not our proximity to the sun that determines seasons. That's right. We are closest to the sun in January, and we are farthest from the sun in July. Behold, I can't take credit for this graphic. I've been trying to figure out who took it, but I really like it. I'm planning on making one like this myself one day using our solar telescope. But look what he's done here. This amateur astronomer has taken two images of the sun. He's registered them with each other. Notice during perihelion, which is when we're closest to the sun, January 4th, this, the sun appears larger. And notice during aphelion, when we are highest or farthest from the sun, the sun appears smaller. Now, I didn't bother actually doing the math, so let's do it right now. I'm going to bring up my calculator. Move. It's, always, it's always inconvenient. All right, so I'm going to divide 147 by 152. So that's a difference of 3.3%. Uh, so, and that's exactly what we observed, by the way. So 3.3% difference in size based entirely on our distance from the sun. Yet, yeah, ironically, it has no bearing on the seasons or a very minimal bearing. Yeah. Questions about that? Perihelion does not agree. With, that's correct. It does not. There's a lot of crooked stuff at work here. The, uh, the shape of our orbit is not exactly in alignment because we live we our orbit is an inclined eccentric ellipse I'm glad you brought that up because i have a video about that that i'm going to show you right now there is another factor at work here one might assume that southern summer would be hotter because southern summer occurs when we are closest to the sun so you might think that southern summer is hotter but southern summer is actually around two degrees cooler on average. And for a fascinating reason, let me show you. Good old Kepler taught us a few things about orbits. Here we have an illustration of Earth's orbit around the sun. Now it is being dramatically exaggerated for clarity here. The colors indicate seasons. So green is spring, the gold is summer, the kind of reddish brown, the maroon is autumn, 
and of course the blue is winter. Notice what happens to Earth's velocity. As it gets closer to the sun, Earth speeds up. Also notice, being depicted, but again exaggerated, that this whole, let's say, mechanism is not centered. This has to do with that discrepancy you brought up, the solstice disagreeing with perihelion. So one of the reasons that the northern hemisphere is actually warmer by two degrees is because, as someone points out in the chat, very good, there's more ground, so to speak, more earth in the northern hemisphere. The southern hemisphere is dominated by oceans, isn't it? Ocean water is a good heat sink. It will absorb a great deal of energy because it, it has the capacity to do so. The reason we have a, what meteorological phenomenon like El Nino is because you have this heat sink releasing energy out of sync with the seasons. I said the word sink a lot. <laughs> out of synchronization. So, um, yeah, water is a good heat sink. But then, here's the exciting part. Because Earth is literally going faster during perihelion, the actual duration of summer is shorter for people in the Southern Hemisphere. Now, they don't measure it that way on a calendar, but there is a discrepancy between meteorological seasons and astronomical seasons because Earth's velocity is not constant. Now, you probably know the average speed of the Earth is about 66,000 miles per hour. It's actually 66.6, .6, so I guess you could say 67,000 miles per hour. However, that is an average, of course. Our lowest speed is about 65,000. I have to write this down. I always forget it. 65,542 miles per hour. Earth's highest speed is 67,779 miles per hour. This is an increase in speed of 3.3%. So our planet goes 3.3% faster during perihelion, which again is our closest approach to the sun. And because of this, northern winter is four days shorter and summer is four days shorter in the south. So summer in the south is four days shorter, winter in the north is four days shorter. Isn't that interesting? Any questions about that? Of course, because we are exposed to less radiance from the sun, Earth is collecting net less energy. And that's why we, another reason why there's less temperature measured during, again, the southern summer. It's literally shorter. We're literally getting we're literally receiving less energy. Questions about that? UV light is much more harmful in Australia summer. Is it not? I've heard, I heard that. That has more to do with the hole in the ozone layer, I think, uh, which uh, you may have seen is actually uh, centered over Australia in the past, which is very bad. Uh, you don't want all that UV radiation. But that has more to do with Earth's atmosphere or the ozone layer specifically than this phenomenon we're discussing right now. Questions about this? By the way, this Earth's eccentricity is not that strong. Mercury's is much higher. For example, this is amazing. Mercury, the planet, experiences a 34% change in velocity throughout the course of its year because there's a tremendous difference between its perihelion and aphelion. And I wrote it down. Uh, Mercury's maximum speed is 156,000 miles per hour, but its minimum is 102,000 miles per hour. So that's a big difference. Yeah. Any questions about that? Questions, questions. That hole is fixing itself. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Uh, you don't get to often tell happy ending stories. You don't get to usually tell positive, uplifting stories about human impact on our planet. But in the case of the ozone holes, we found that they are indeed shrinking because of all the regulations that we passed back in the 1980s that limit the production of chemical compounds that destroy ozone in the upper atmosphere. So yeah, it, seems, it does seem to be working. However, the repair is slower than expected. And it turns out that's because some countries are not uh, abiding by the regulations. Um, that's, that's actually kind of recent news. In the last few years, we've discovered that, that. Yay, good news, ozone holes are shrinking. But bad news, not as fast as we thought. But still, progress is something to talk about. So that's a nice, that's a happy story, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Someone mentioned Freon. That's right. CFCs. And also, there was uh, capacitors in all of our, uh, our grid systems that also had those chemicals in them as well. That's right. Questions, questions. I have a few more things to go over, but I thought this I thought this topic of the velocity might fascinate some of you. Let's see. I'm looking for questions. But I don't see them, so I'm going to keep going. Now, are seasons limited to Earth? No. Now, I just talked about Mercury a little bit, and there is something worth mentioning. When someone tells you that, no, our proximity to the sun 
is not the determining factor when it comes to seasons. Our tilt is. That's true of Earth, but it's not true of everyone. So here's a picture of planet Mercury. Now, I, I showed you guys this, this chart. Uh, what was it? You, on last show, I think. And you can clearly see here that Mercury is not very crooked, is it? Mercury's obliquity is only 0 0.1 degrees, almost perfectly straight up and down. As a result, in the case of Mercury, its seasons are determined by proximity to the sun for, the two, for two reasons. Because first, the tilt is not that extreme, and also because its distance varies greatly when it comes to the sun. So yeah, there are planets that experience seasons because of distance and not because of tilt. If you're curious, the reason that Mercury is so straight up and down and not tilted very much is because being so close to the sun, the sun tidally interacts with the surface of Mercury, essentially riding the planet, essentially pulling the planet into a straight up and down orientation. So yeah, gravitational interaction can actually alter the obliquity of a planet. Notice Venus, she seems pretty up and down and straight too, except if you look at the number there, 177 degrees, essentially Venus is upside down. We don't know why. But uh, apparently, we, we assume it had something to do with an interaction early in her existence. Earth, with its famous 23 degrees, and also Mars, too. These are two planets that definitely have seasons because of tilt. Notice Mars, excuse me, Mars. Notice Jupiter is almost straight up and down. Again, this is a planet that's more seasonally determined by its proximity to the sun. But then look at Saturn. Saturn has 27 degree tilt, kind of similar to Earth. And then look at Uranus and Neptune. They have wild tilts. In the case of Uranus, it'll have a global winter that will last for decades on one hemisphere and a global, actually I should be pointing over here, and a global summer that will again last for decades in the other. Saturn also has seasons that last for over a decade. And I want to show you something pretty cool. The, the New Horizons, not New Horizons, I apologize, the Cassini spacecraft visited Saturn and discovered seasonal variation in the famous hexagonal cloud, or, or rather storm, that exists at its pole. So the Saturnian North Pole was in shadow for years, and we see more icy clouds forming, literally weather, winter weather, in the upper uh, latitudes of Saturn, because it experiences seasons due to tilt, just like we do. This is a series of images of Saturn taken by the Hubble Space Telescope from 1996 to 2000. As you can see, its orientation seems to shift. Of course, Saturn is not really wobbling up and down. The reason it appears to do this is because of its highly inclined orbit. So sometimes Saturn will be, so to speak, above the sun. Sometimes it is below the sun. I believe I demonstrated that in the last video or two, that Saturn will appear sometimes quite above the ecliptic plane and quite below it because of its crooked orbit. So yes, Saturn has seasons for the same reason we do. How interesting. Any questions about that? What happened to Uranus? We don't know why Uranus is crooked or so sideways. It's probably the same thing. We, we always assume that when a body is inexplicably misbehaving, that it has something to do with a great collision or some calamitous interaction in its ancient past. That is our assumption. By the way, there is more evidence than just that assumption. Uh, it turns out both Uranus and Neptune's electromagnetic cores, if they have them, are not anywhere near the centers of the planet. Uh, Uranus's magnetic field centers on a region beneath the surface, but nowhere near the core. This does definitely indicate some kind of collision of great magnitude occurred that would screw up a planet that badly that its electromagnetic core would be far, far from its center. Yeah. So, yeah, that is evidence that Uranus was clobbered, not just the fact that Uranus is sideways. Yeah. Good question. Yeah, like Earth and Theia. Very good. So, Theia obliterating our planet could very well be the reason why Earth is crooked, but also why our magnetic field is crooked. Our magnetic field also disagrees with the tilt of our planet, and it does seem to be off-center, not nearly as severely as Uranus's is, but still, that's interesting. Yeah, again, evidence of a collision. One thing we keep finding more and more, and it's a little bit frightening, is just how violent the ancient solar system was and how apparently common giant collisions were. I wouldn't have wanted to be around back then. Although, I, I actually, that's not true. I would, If I had a time machine, I would love to observe our ancient solar system. I guarantee there'd be some surprises. I bet there'd be planets we don't recognize because they... Uh, after the fact, were destroyed or eaten by the sun or eaten by gas giants or pulverized. Yeah, so I think our solar system would be a very alien place indeed if you were to visit it billions of years ago. Yeah, something that I think any astronomer would love to be able to do or any scientist, go back in time and see what things used to be like.
Yeah. Good question. Good questions. All right. Let's see here. So no. So Venus and Uranus are both orbiting in prograde, so the, the right way. But Venus and Uranus are spinning the wrong way, so their retrograde rotation, but not their revolution around the sun. That's a good question. It would be cool from a safe distance. I agree. Yes. <laughs> Does the change in velocity affect gravity? Uh, not really. Uh, you, you theoretically could calculate that it would, but it wouldn't be something that would dramatically affect, for example, the, the goings on on the surface of a planet. That being said, over extremely, extremely long periods of time, the tidal interaction could indeed tug on the surface. Now, I mentioned with Mercury, Mercury is most likely so straight up and down because of tidal interaction with the sun. And the fact that Mercury has such a highly eccentric orbit and also so highly inclined it may have something to do with that interaction. So over long periods of time, long periods of time, yes, short period of time, at, no, probably not. Yeah. That's an interesting question. That being said, it's hard to make any absolute concrete statements anymore like that because we are realizing just how incredibly busy our universe is. We learn now that most stars have planets orbiting them, and some of them have truly bizarre planets. That's actually a segue into something I wanted to show you guys tonight. Watch this. Since we talked about seasons on other worlds in our own solar system, now let's talk about them in a different solar system altogether. This is TRAPPIST-1. I've talked about this system before in other shows. It's so fascinating, it's always worth talking about. So TRAPPIST-1 is an ultra-low mass red dwarf star. It is orbited by seven Earth-like planets, and they're so close to their parent star that if you were there, this is actually what it would look like. This looks like something out of science fiction where you see planets as balls in the sky as opposed to the specks of light. But they're so close to each other that that's actually how they would appear. This entire star system would fit inside of the orbit of planet Mercury. It's actually smaller than the orbit of Jupiter's major moons. Look at that. So the entire TRAPPIST-1 system will fit in this puny little space. Now the reason I'm bringing this up is because there's something interesting about these worlds because of where they are because they are so close to the trappist one star they are tidally locked to their star this means that these planets have permanent day and permanent night hemispheres now that's something we do not see anywhere in our solar system nowhere in our solar system do we see a body with a permanent day and a permanent night that, that takes seasons to a whole other lever. You essentially have the, the, the permanent day side, which we assume would be warm and hot, and the permanent night side, which we assume would be cold. The only reason why they might not be that way is if you had some kind of mediating factor, some kind of fluid medium like, for example, an atmosphere or oceans. We have an artistic rendering here that likes to pretend there might be oceans on these three worlds in the Goldilocks zone. Yes, there are three Goldilocks planets in the TRAPPIST-1 system. That is to say, worlds that are in a region where they might be able to sustain liquid water, not so far that they freeze, not so close that they vaporize. So three Goldilocks planets in the TRAPPIST-1 system. Just like we have three Goldilocks planets, a lot of people don't realize that Venus, Earth, and Mars are also Goldilocks zone parent planets. Only one of them is a nice place to live because we have a combination of the right thickness of atmosphere, the right combination, and also a strong magnetic field that protects it. So we don't know that TRAPPIST-1, D, E, and F are actually nice places to live. They might be horrifying like Venus or horrifying like Mars or horrifying in some other <laughs> as-of-yet-undiscovered way, but, but it's interesting to point out that they could be nice places to live. And all, it, that, again, is determined by the composition of their atmospheres and the strength of their magnetic fields, if they have one. So yeah, think about that. Seven Earth-like planets in a star system where they have a permanent day and permanent night. And also look at the duration of the years. TRAPPIST-1b's year is only 1.5 days. The longest year in the entire system is 20 years, or 20 days rather, 20 days. Think about that. That's a neat thing to think about. Someone points out that Mars used to be a nice place to live. That's right. We know that Mars used to have liquid water on its surface. We know that it also used to have a thick atmosphere. And we know that it used to have a strong magnetic field. Mars is no longer a nice place to live. That's another thing to remember. Even if these worlds were once nice, they might not be nice now. So, interesting topic. Questions about that? All right, happy to say I'm actually on time. I'm, I'm going to show you a video to start to kind of wrap it up. Um, this has been kind of a quiet chat night, but I understand why. This is a this is a topic that's kind of straightforward, and that's why I didn't expect this show to be a very long. So let me show you something cool put out by the California Academy of Sciences. This is uh, this is satellite data of phytoplankton and other photosynthetic organisms 
responding to the availability of sunlight. And what we see here is that it seems to move up and down. The, the, the life, the band of greenery seems to move up and down our planet. And of course, this is synchronized with the availability of sunlight, seasonal sunlight caused by our tilt, right? Let me speed this up a bit so you can see it a little bit better. As you can see, it's not an entire year, but you get the point. I think that's pretty nifty. Any questions about that? Yeah, so uh, life on Earth response to seasons. I find this is kind of deep. I think it's deep that something that we take for granted, like seasons, we think of it as something that's so permanent, you know, that's so universal, that's so always and and uh, always there, always always to be counted on, is truly a, a manifestation of a bunch of chaotic factors. The tilt of our planet, the distance from its star, the shape of our orbit, the speed of our orbit. These factors vary from world to world, don't they? So if you were an alien creature living on another world with different metrics, you would take that for granted. A very simple example, uh, not, not a very extreme example, would be the planet Mars, where it has a 25-hour day. To you, you wouldn't think anything of that. Of course, you're used to it. You grew up there. But uh, think about the fact that all these things that we consider to be normal on this planet are the result of, the, like I said, the tilt of our world, the speed, the shape of its orbit, etc. And by the way, these things are not permanent. I mentioned in previous videos that Earth's day length has changed significantly over eons of time due to interactions with the moon, due to volcanism, due to, to plate tectonics, due to, to uh, earthquakes. You might have heard uh, during the Asian tsunami, so much mass was subducted under the top crust that Earth's rotation rate increased slightly and the day became ever so slightly shorter. Yeah, so we have to constantly update our uh, universal clocks. We, universal coordinated time is not a constant time. We adjust it. We fix it over time. Not just to compensate for obvious things like, ye like ye leap year, but also these very minor things I mentioned, these very subtle perturbations caused by natural catastrophes and other things. Yeah. Questions, questions. This is your last chance. What satellite took the footage? You know, I don't know the answer to that question off the top of my head. I'm not sure which satellite. It, it actually, it's based on what I'm watching. It's actually multiple satellites. So, yeah, if you want to look it up, it, it was, again, the California Academy of Sciences put this out. I'm sure you could figure that out if you if you found the video. I'm sure I would hope that they explained which which satellites were responsible. All right, last chance to ask questions or make comments. I'm going to show you that video of the uh, Great Conjunction again in a second because it is cool. I'm just making sure I didn't miss anything. Okay, so watch this. I'm going to put up. Um, some of the images I took of the Great Conjunction there on Thursday. Now I'm going to shrink this down so you can see the whole thing. And I'm going to move into the future. And you can see here the telescope is tracking the moon and the two planets. And of course they are setting and it's getting darker out. And eventually the clouds eat Saturn and Jupiter. There they go. Consumed. I hope you don't get vanquished by clouds tomorrow. I strongly, strongly encourage you all to try to see the transit. Move that there. The, uh, they call it transit, I apologize, the Great Conjunction. Don't miss the Great Conjunction. It is uh, something you don't get to see very often. Like I said, these only happen every 20 years. This is one of the best one in several centuries. Uh, I, I did do a simulation of the next one uh, in 2040. It is, as, as stated, not as nice as this one. But yeah, keep that in mind. You don't need the world's best telescope to reveal the proximity of the two bodies. If you look through even binoculars, you should be able to reveal not just how close Jupiter and Saturn have become, but also the positions of their moons. Uh, the bright moon Callisto will be similar in distance from Jupiter as Saturn will appear. And notice that word appear. Remember, these, these are not real events. Co conjunctions are not actual alignments with bodies. They're not actually getting close to each other. It's an alignment created by our position, our perspective. It's a figment of our perspective. Don't forget that. Yeah. All right. We actually finished on time tonight. I'm going to give you a few more seconds, and then I'm going to sign off. So your last chance. I'm, I'm looking for a chance. This has been a really quiet night, but again, I'm not that surprised based on what we're talking about. Preferred forecast tool. You mean like weather forecast? I don't really have one. Um, use whatever whatever your phone de defaults to. I don't have an opinion on that. Um, 
Long wave, infrared, etc. What does that have to do? What, what are we talking about here? I will tell you uh, what the next show is. We're going to be talking about uh, the fact that the North Star changes. That has something to do with what we discussed tonight. And someone brought up the reason why. It's because our planet wobbles. We'll talk about not only the fact that the North Star changes, but the fact that there is no South Star. And we'll, we'll make sense of all that. Those are much uh, longer term phenomena than what we talked about tonight. Everything we learned about tonight really is something you experience on a yearly basis. This is not, these are not uh, slow moving events. You, you obviously experience seasons every year. We experience multiple solstices and equinoxes every year. So, all right, well, with that, please don't forget to like and subscribe. And uh, we hope to see you again next week. And uh, please tell your friends. Word of mouth is very effective, we've discovered, when it comes to getting people to watch videos. And uh, thank you, Happy, that Northwest Spokane tweeted. Oh, I didn't even know about that. I'll have to look into that. Thanks. Uh, it's nice to be tweeted about, hopefully in a positive way. You know, I'm not on that whole Twitter thing. I guess I'm, I guess I'm an old man when it comes to that stuff. I don't really know much about Twitter. I mean, I know of its existence, but I don't make much use of it. I try to hide from all you people when I'm not doing my job. You're so scary, right? Be nice to me and be nice to each other. And uh, again, I wish you luck tomorrow. I I, I should have probably repeated myself because it's kind of a big deal. Um, so people are asking about Tuesday. Of course, I want to make it absolutely clear. We do not have to wait until tomorrow to see the Great Conjunction. You could have been watching it all year as the two objects got closer. If you miss it tomorrow, please don't be depressed. Go out the next day. You will almost certainly, I mean, if the weather allows it, you'll almost certainly see them very close to each other because, of course, they will be. So yeah, don't don't freak out if you miss the moment, the exact millisecond of greatest conjunction, because frankly, there isn't much difference in appearance between tomorrow and the day after, or tonight for that matter. Yeah, so I'm glad you asked that. Yeah, the great conjunction uh, is frankly rewarding to look at weeks before or after, or even months. Yeah, so that, that's a good question to part ways on. I hope you guys keep that in mind. In other words, to summarize, please try. If you fail tomorrow night, try the next night. If you fail then, try again. I've actually been pretty lucky. I've gotten quite a few glimpse, glimpses of the two over the last month. So it is worth trying. You Be diligent. And also remember, be curious. And uh, I, will, I will see you guys. Also, wait, tomorrow night at 5. So tomorrow night, 5 o'clock, I will try to do a show. And if the weather prevents it, I will put up a, a banner saying, you know, show canceled, sorry for the weather, whatever. Okay, now, hopefully I'll see you tomorrow.